Right. Good afternoon, everybody here in Eastern Canada, and good morning to those joining us from the West Coast. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the webinar today, where we're talking about Canada's small business economy, credit trends, and what's next. Within the session here today, we'll be exploring the uneven impact of the pandemic and going to do a deep dive into commercial real estate, inflation, interest rates, and even some potential impacts on the Eastern European conflict. In order to cover these industries and be as informed as possible, today we'll be bringing some very special guests. Both of our guests are passionate and well-informed individuals who will share with you what they see in their day-to-day -day lives and open your eyes and mind to what you need to think about as we go through 2022. Small, uh, small businesses across all industries have been heavily impacted throughout the pandemic. And the federal uh, programs that acted as a lifeline for many of them have been phased out or, or really even pivoted. We've seen throughout this week as well that a lot of the mask mandates and restrictions are starting to be lifted. So this is surely a sign of cautious optimism. Small businesses look to act like a fireweed, the first beautiful element to emerge from a scorched and tarnished event. What we're really trying to get to the bottom of today is what are the key economic factors that we need to be aware of as we collectively look to help small businesses hit exponential growth and recreate a strong economy. My name is Jeff Brown, and I'm head of small business strategy and innovation here at Equifax Canada, and I'm genuinely excited about our session today. So before we get into the content, I'd like to pass it over to my colleague, Sandra Shep, who will be covering a few housekeeping items on the logistics of the webinar, just to ensure that we have a smooth experience here today. So Sandra, over to you. Thank you, Jeff, and good afternoon, everyone. Each area within the webinar platform is responsive, so you can maximize or min minimize each widget or box based on your viewing needs. Our presenters are on camera in the media player in the middle of your screen today, and our slide deck will be showing within this media player. We'll have a couple of polling questions for you to participate in, and those will pop up within the slide widget on the left side of your screen, so be sure to watch out for those. There's an ask a question widget underneath the media player, so feel free to enter any questions you may have, and we'll address them throughout our session today. In the event there's too many questions to get through, we'll generate an FAQ document, which we'll send out to you in the coming weeks. Our presentation is available in the related content widget for downloading, and French materials will be available in the next few days. Today's session is also being recorded, and you will receive the on-demand link via email tomorrow. Bios of our speakers appear on the right, and some new features today that you'll notice. There's a smiley face widget in the bottom of your screen. Feel free to click on it and let us know how you're feeling about today's presentation. You'll also see a register now widget, which allows you to register for our upcoming fraud trends webinar on March 22nd. Check it out. We ask that you provide your feedback by taking a short survey, which will automatically pop up at the end of the webinar. You can also access it by clicking on the feedback icon at the bottom of your screen as well at any time. To the right of that feedback icon is a contact us button. Send us an email if you'd like further information and a team member will be happy to help. Now let's get started. Jeff, back to you. All right, thank you so much, Sandra. So, so we're at this special time of the year when the snow is starting to melt and we've all broken our New Year's resolutions and we're all looking to head back to the office. Well, really essentially trying to ignore the gas pumps that uh, continue to have skyrocketing prices. While we all hate traffic on the roads, I think we should all try to look at it as a sign of positivity. It means we're emerging from our hibernation and taking a few extra steps to better ourselves and the world around us. So on that note, let's jump into an economic update. So a key item that we need to mention is that GDP has yet to reach pre-pandemic levels, but inflation has really started to rise dramatically. Prior to the pandemic, we saw a consumer price index move in perfect harmony with GDP. What has ended up is that this pent up consumer demand for the pandemic, coupled with a strong housing market, has contributed to a rise in inflation. That spike in consumer price index really took off at the beginning of last year and has showed no sign of slowing down. When we compare that, the overall consumer price index, excluding energy, we see that energy is playing a more and more important role in driving consumer prices. From a high level view, as indicated in the chart on the right, pricing in gasoline, transportation, food, and real estate, all of which are essential needs, have gone up the most over the past two years. A 30% year-over-year increase, which was recorded even before the Ukraine-Russia conflict, 
that number shows no sign of slowing down anytime soon either. It's a good thing we have the panelists that we do have today, as I'm specifically interested to hear their perspective on it. That being said, as a consumer, these numbers are scary. The amount of burden that these price increases have on a household budget could be downright crippling if these trends continue. So while we talk about increased, increased costs, it's important to know that this isn't all doom and gloom, as are a few signs of hope in key sectors. In this chart on the left, we're looking at sales dollars by industry indexed to prior to the pandemic. With this, we see the obvious drop in dollars spent during the initial waves of the pandemic, with restaurants, service establishments taking a large dip. However, when you look ahead into Q2 and Q3 of last year, we see that there was a resurgent back to pre-pandemic levels in dollars spent. This was likely due to pent-up consumer demand, but then as new restrictions were introduced in Q4, we all saw the Omicron variant, and this took a hit on the full service and limited service eating places. When we look at the chart on the right, we see a dramatic increase in the number of job vacancies coupled with a jump in the hourly wage that's being offered. With the easing of restrictions happening across the country here in March, my personal speculation would be that we'll see a decrease in both of these variables. We will make uh, sure to ask our panelists here shortly on their opinion on this matter as well. So we're lucky enough to have the chief economist from Business Development Bank of Canada on our panel here today. So we'll have some further economic updates from them later in the session. So with that macro level view, we'll dive into the data and insights from Equifax Canada's commercial database. So the theme to the current state of small business and commercial credit is the balance between debt and delinquency. During the course of the pandemic, the federal government has injected billions of dollars directly into small businesses through grants, subsidies, and loans. And on the loans front, the Canadian Emergency Business Account, or CEBA, alone has accounted for over $49 billion worth of loans to almost 900,000 businesses. When these funds hit the hands of small business owners, for the most part, the money was used wisely paying off or down utilized, highly utilized accounts or past due and delinquent accounts. When this happened, it also created this artificial improvement of those businesses' credit ratings, essentially meaning to credit managers across the country, these businesses began to look like A1 premium customers, when in actuality, they might not be. These same businesses have then used those strong credit ratings to slowly increase their debts over the past year by about 20.7% or by an average of $35,000. This isn't necessarily a bad thing because as we've mentioned in the past, businesses need to be spending money in order to be making money. If we quickly look across to the right over at delinquencies, again, it's all about a healthy balance between rising debt and lowering delinquencies. Year over year, 30 plus day delinquencies have reduced by 10.8% with a slowdown on that progression over the past quarter. While this currently looks positive, it's extremely important to understand what pre-pandemic or business as usual delinquency rates are in Canada. In a healthy transacting economy that was showing really strong growth in 2019, 30 plus day delinquencies are usually above 10%. That means at any given time, on average, 10% of businesses in Canada have an account that is at least 30 days past due. So as these restrictions continue to ease and government funding evaporates, those delinquency rates are going to shoot right back up, which could even arguably be higher than they were before. As small businesses try to adjust really to a rebound of consumer demand and spending. When you compound a higher debt burden with an anticipated increase in delinquency rates, it means that not if, but when all small businesses go delinquency or when small businesses go delinquency here soon, the hole that they have to dig themselves out of will be quite difficult and, and larger than it was prior to the pandemic. Compound on top of that, the expectation of a CEDA loan repayment is due in 2023. And it becomes clear that as a collective, all of us here on the webinar today have to ensure we instill a healthy dose of credit education to small businesses in our everyday interactions. Another warning signal that we're starting to see is a, is a catch up of the negative occurrence at credit life cycle. So as you may have heard me mention before, as we go from delinquencies to collections, to legal proceedings, and then to bankruptcies, during the pandemic, delinquencies were reduced by federal support and lenders offering deferrals. Uh, collection companies paused for 2020 and 2021 on doing outbound calls. Court proceedings were delayed and rescheduled due to capacity issues. And each of these phases also meant that there were even fewer businesses that could make their way through that final stage to bankruptcy. When we look at the insolvency rates, while year over year it's held fairly steady, 
when we cast our eyes on that quarter to quarter change, the alarm bells are starting to go off. We saw a 36.5% increase in small business insolvencies. This tells us that the backlog of negative occurrences is starting to clear up and a surge of companies are about to make their way through that corridor. Fortunately, with a surge of businesses now expecting to exit, we are seeing a strong growth number on new businesses that are emerging, uh, emerging and financially transacting to take their place. Year over year, we've seen a 61.6% increase in this area, which is phenomenal. Yes, quarter over quarter, it's taken a minor dip, but this is only because historically spring and summer months are most often when Canada's newly formed businesses start to financially transact. In fact, businesses are almost twice as likely to do so during those time periods. So when we shift our focus onto credit inquiries, we've seen a steady decrease in businesses requesting credit. And based on what we just went through on debt levels, this should be viewed as a positive thing, oddly enough. It means that as the pandemic starts to wrap up, small businesses feel that they're saturated with the amount of debt that they've taken on. As a credit manager, what this means for you is that requests for credit limit increases should be reduced in the first half of 2022. This also means that you should review and make decisions on the amount of exposure you might have on higher risk accounts. Tighten your scorecards and keep a close eye on requests for increased credit and double and triple check. The chart on the right shows us that we're still dramatically off from inquiry levels from the pre-pandemic era. In fact, only Alberta and Ontario are currently showing any growth in comparison to last year. In Alberta, those increases are likely due to lenders and credit managers reevaluating high-risk accounts, much like we saw in the first six months of the, uh, the pandemic in, in 2020. In Ontario, this is due to the fact that restrictions were far deeper than other provinces in 2020, and some lightened in 2021 as it uh, provided a larger amount of relief. So now when we examine trade volume, it allows us to view the conversion rates between credit inquiries and newly approved applications. On the left-hand side, we're looking at industry trades, and these trades are small businesses that are purchasing goods, uh, purchasing goods from service suppliers, not to be confused with loans, credit cards, or mortgages. So as we rounded out 2021, we see that the growth stemming from businesses less than six months old has been a steady and consistent rise since the pandemic occurred. This is quite a juxtaposition when we compare it to the well-established businesses that have seen wildly swinging ebbs and flows throughout the past two years. So to put this all in perspective, 50% of all new industrial trades are stemming from businesses that are less than six months old. So what does that tell us? So if you'd like to grow your business as restrictions are being lifted, your odds grow exponentially if you place confidence in newly established businesses. What this also means is that the customers that you were previously relying on to keep your portfolio healthy pre-pandemic are not the same businesses that will lead to your growth after the pandemic is fully ended. To state that in clearer terms, if you haven't already altered your marketing practices towards new businesses or reevaluated your risk tolerance to newly established businesses, you're losing out on substantial growth opportunity. Again, this is just in the industrial trade space. When we focus on financial trades, so loans, credit cards, mortgages, it should be extremely evident of what's happened. In April 2020, the origination level for financial products dropped by almost 30%. In some parts due to restrictions, but in, to a large degree, it was the amount of interest-free government-backed loans and grants that hit the marketplace. Recovery has been slow in this area where new accounts are concerned, and in Q4 of 2021, there was a noted drop in originations across all ages. So we anticipate an origination growth in the second half of 2022 as the economy recovers, and small businesses begin to evaluate the requirements to lessen their growing debt levels, both from an industry trade perspective, but also from a SIBA loan perspective. When we look at where new trade growth is coming from, we see two interesting insights. First, from a recovery perspective, Wholesale, retail, and service industries are showing high levels of growth compared to 2020 levels. However, when looking at the gray, we can tell that each is still quite a ways from anything resembling normal. When we look at the transportation industry, given the increased price of fuel, this is a good indication that things will likely only get worse before they get better. We'll examine this a bit deeper with our panelists here shortly. On the right-hand side, we've examined the, the corresponding growth by financial product type. As you can see, each took a large hit in comparison to 2019, like we've already discussed. But what's important here is the bounce back by product type. 
While lines of credit took the largest hit throughout the pandemic, its rate of rebound has been very strong over the past 12 months. So please look for that pace and trend to continue here over the next three to six months as our economy continues to reopen. So continuing on that positive note, we continue to see a very healthy recovery in the newly established business space. For reference, the last three months of each year, that is historically when we see the lowest level of new businesses opening up. So when we saw that year over year, there was a 62% growth in that area in 2021, all signs are pointing to a potentially historic level of new business growth in the summer. From a marketing perspective, this really needs to be kept in mind as all data that we've reviewed thus far has shown us that new businesses are where financial success will be gained for suppliers and lenders alike in 2022. From a province to province viewpoint, Quebec continues to outperform all provinces for newly established businesses, where there's been a 114% increase in new businesses when compared to the same time period last year. Provinces opting out of pandemic restrictions is a major factor in future consumer confidence and newly formed businesses emerging in those spaces. So as I mentioned off the top, delinquencies are at an all-time low and now reached kind of a bottom level plateau that will definitely be rising in the first half of 2022. For 30 plus day delinquencies, there will be a rush back up to the 10 to 11% range over the next six months. As businesses edge back to uh, normal levels of transactions, we anticipate 30 plus and 90 plus day delinquencies to hold their current levels and resemble closely to what they've remained at for 2021. So you can put your money on it. Delinquency rates will not go any lower than they currently are. It's now just a matter of closely monitoring how fast they're going to rise. From a credit management perspective, the best thing that can be done is to set alerts and monitoring practices to be informed on any and all 30 plus day delinquencies that are past due and essentially evaluate case by case and, es and escalate as, as you need. One of the many reasons we can see that delinquency rates will be on the rise is that in the past quarter, Ontario showed its first quarter since the pandemic started of a rise, of, uh, a rise in these rates as shown in the graph on the right hand side. So one of the key variables that everybody was gravitating towards during the, the beginning of the pandemic was how many businesses have gone bankrupt. While it would have been nice to look at, it really is a lagging indicator. And there are a series of negative occurrences that really need to be considered prior to looking at the black and white nature of a bankruptcy. So as I mentioned, we look at delinquencies, collections, legal action, and then bankruptcies in that order as one is a precursor to the next. So when we look at bankruptcies, we should all expect them to be low during the pandemic, like they are, given the circumstances that I mentioned. So just like we've been starting to see the 30 plus day delinquencies rise in Ontario, we are now starting to see an aggressive uptick in the number of bankruptcies that are being reported from the superintendent of bankruptcy. Q4 of 2021 represented a 13.5 growth when compared to the same time period in 2020. Just like delinquencies, expect these numbers to rise as small businesses across the country fight to reestablish themselves within the economy. It's always like Quebec is showing the most aggressive growth in new businesses. They also by far have the largest quarter by quarter growth in bankruptcies. So it's such a sweet and sour province right now, which means that extra due diligence is going to be required for writing deals in that province for the first half of 2022. So one thing that makes small businesses incredibly difficult to monitor in Canada is the right to a self-selected closure. So what is that? It's, it's essentially for the ability for a business to just decide to no longer operate at any given time without needing to go through the process of negative occurrence life cycle, which ultimately leads, leads to bankruptcy. So during the pandemic, Equifax Canada has been watching this very, very closely. We've been monitoring businesses that had reoccurring invoice with, uh, invoices with major suppliers each month, and then suddenly stopped. While there have been plenty of survey-based statistics shared in the marketplace with regards to closure speculation, we're happy to share that business closures are fairly minor compared to what's been published. Heavily hit provinces like Alberta have only seen the 2.5% overall businesses go through self-selected closures that were actually financially active during 2020. What this tells us is there's been an overemphasis on the negative news stories over the past 12 months, because in actuality, self-selected closures have only impacted a small fraction of overall businesses. Now, it's not to paint too rosy of a picture, as, as businesses are still facing a, a large debt burden but it shows us for the most part, small businesses are continuing to fight through the uphill battle that the pandemic has really brought on. So with all that information really brings us to the bottom line of what we're seeing from a credit trends perspective. I think what we've established is that while the pandemic has taken a huge toll on small businesses, 
there, there are reasons to be cautiously optimistic due to business growth numbers and the loosening of restrictions. That being said, as credit professionals, there are marked areas where we'll need to roll up our sleeves here in the coming months to protect ourselves, as well as to direct our marketing campaigns to be targeted to high growth and healthy industries. When it comes to monitoring, we need to remain diligent to identify signs of early financial stress, most notably on the delinquency front. The current numbers will rise across all industries, so it's just a matter of being able to identify which businesses are one-time occurrence versus those that are quickly to slide through that negative credit uh, life cycle. When it comes to interest rates and inflation, it's an incoming headwind, which we will go through detail with our panelists. So without uh, any further ado, um, let's move over to the panel portion of today's discussion where we'll work to kind of understand the, the path ahead. So, um, so we'll start with introducing our panelists. Um, so it's my pleasure to first introduce Pierre Clouro, Chief Economist at the Business Development Bank of Canada. So Pierre, over to you to tell us a little bit about yourself and your organization. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, sorry, I had um, an issue with uh, unmuting myself, which is, seems to be a big sign of this pandemic. Uh, so I'm Pierre Clouro, I'm the Chief Economist at BDC. BDC is uh, the only banks that serve um, entrepreneurs. So we have about 70,000 clients across the country in every sector of the economy and in every uh, stage of their life cycle. So we, have, uh, we serve uh, startups and also very mature, uh, larger companies. Perfect. Thanks for that, Pierre. Um, so next, I'd like to introduce Claudia Verneau, who's head of research at JLL. So Claudia, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your organization? Yes, thank you, Jeff, and good good afternoon and good morning, everyone. Uh, it is really my pleasure to be here today. So my name is Claudia Verneau, and I head the research team for JLL Canada. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, JLL is a Fortune 500 company and one of the largest global commercial real estate service providers um, with offices in more than 80 countries and more than 98,000 employees worldwide. In Canada, we have about 2,000 employees and have national presence in 10 cities. We provide a full range of integrated property, project management and transaction services locally, regionally and globally through our Americas, Europe, Middle East, Africa, and Asia Pacific operating segments. My team provides research and data support to the brokerage, capital markets, and project development services practices, all while uh, developing local and national market insights, which are accessible through our uh, website. And I invite you all to read. Perfect. Thank you so much, Claudia. So with that, let's uh, let's kick into the discussions, and uh, you know we'll start off with a polling question. So Sandra, if you could bring up our first polling question of the day. All right. So the first question here is uh, thinking about the long term future. Do you expect to be um, again for our audience here working from home entirely, in the office only occasionally, mainly working from the office, being back in the office full time, or? Or who knows? So everybody in the audience, if you can kind of quickly uh, select your option here, and uh, we'll give you a few seconds, and then we will look at the results. Again, everybody's situation has changed here during the pandemic, and it's work from home. Some people still have to work in the office uh, throughout the pandemic, which would have been a challenge in itself. But uh, if you wouldn't mind just quickly uh, shooting us a response, and, and we'll see kind of what the, the vibe is across everybody in the, in the credit industry. All right, Sandra, if you could close the uh, the results here and let's uh, let's see where we ended up. All right, so uh, overwhelming response, we have 55.6% of in the office office only occasionally. Um, and, and I think all of us, you know, prior to this, we were all likely in the office. I mean, it was kind of the, the vibe and nature to what was going on. And, um, you know, honestly, looking at that 14.3% of overwhelming from home entirely. Um, back in, these restrictions are changing. Um, there's, everybody's trying to evaluate their policies and how much your personal world has changed um, prior to, to having to come back into the office and, and changing the way you work. So really interesting perspective. Thank you for the audience for, uh, for having that response. All right, so Claudia, we're gonna go through and tap into your expertise now here. So, um, so since the pandemic started, I think we've all seen a way that, uh, you know, 
consumer real estate market has just shifted to levels that, that nobody could have imagined. Um, can you take us back to kind of March 2020 when the pandemic really started to become a reality for us here in Canada? So what did it look like from a, a commercial real estate perspective? So from from a, a commercial real estate perspective, um, before this big pandemic hit, um, the, nation, the national vacancy rate was about 9.9% for urban and suburban office space, which was close to the 20 year average. But there were still quite a lot of variability across cities with Vancouver and Toronto leading the, the pack in terms of uh, lowest availability and Calgary and Edmonton trailing behind. Um, across submarkets, uh, vacancy rates were generally lower in downtown areas and the suburbs. And across asset classes, uh, trophy and class A buildings were the ones with the lowest vacancy. On the industrial real estate side, uh, the occupancy was already tight before the pandemic. Um, so their vacancy rates were about 2.4 nationally uh, through the first quarter of 2020, which was uh, already below the long term average. Uh, and the variation across uh, Canada's main CMAs was not as stark as in the case of uh, office building, but the situation on the industrial side mirrored that of the office side with Toronto and Vancouver displaying very low single digit vacancy rates and Calgary and Edmonton having a more, a bit more availability. Perfect. No, that's, uh, that's, that's great perspective. And um, you know, before I go into the next question here, I just want to remind the audience, if you have any questions, um, for Claudia on the commercial real estate market that we can potentially ask her right now, feel free to chime in and uh, we'll see if we can include it in and, uh, and get her expertise. So, so Claudia, with us having a good understanding of where we were pre-pandemic now, what series of events has, has GLL seen take place and, and really what's driving the occupancy rates and the, the square foot prices in com uh, commercial real estate right now? I mean, obviously work from home has been an interesting journey for us all as we saw in kind of the, the responses there, but um, What's really what's happened during the pandemic and what kind of behavior is, is kind of dictating what's gone on? Yeah, so when the pandemic hit, uh, we were all all of a sudden tossed into a large scale experiment in remote working. So even companies that were not offering that option to their employees all of a sudden had to adapt to stay alive. Right. And so um, and. It, it, the, the thing is that uh, this this experiment lasted two years, so it really created um, habits, and uh, and society, you know, uh, has pretty much adapted to um, you know uh, uh, interacting virtually, shopping online, and so um, and it has created uh, some sort of expectations too, um, and. Uh, um, and on the real estate side, this sort of uh, event has really caused uh, a big, big disruption, a big creative disruption, I would call it. Let me explain you why. So um, the fact that, uh, that uh, workers were able to, uh, to, to work remotely um, has uh, really questioned the, uh, the workspace environment and has allowed people to, um, to do a lot of the activities that they were doing before from home. And uh, um, and uh, the majority of companies then have had to come to terms with these habits that have been created and have adopted uh, a hybrid workspace to accommodate employees' preference for, uh, you know, more flexible arrangements. So um, we, uh, we have conducted um, a survey among uh, workers to see what their preferences was. So it's similar to what you just uh, showed us here, but only we asked the um, workers what they prefer, not what they expected, right? And so what came out there from that uh, survey is that, uh, um, uh, again, the majority of uh, people would prefer to have a flexible work environment. So they do miss... Um, an excellent workspace, that's how they, they define it. But uh, they uh, they do also like to have the flexibility of working from home. And so, um, you know, their preference would be that, uh, uh, say, uh, three days out of five, they could show up at work and then uh, work remotely for the remainder two days, right? So that has obviously uh, uh, questioned, um, you know, the, the entire business model for a lot of companies and made them reflect on what their uh, future workspace should look like, right? So um, as, uh, during the pandemic, um, a lot of companies have started to sublease some of their, uh, of their space, thinking that perhaps, 
you know, uh, less workers would uh, uh, would be willing to come back. But as the time progressed, and you know, we are conducting this survey every year, so we see like the evolution of of, a, uh, of worker sentiment, if you want. Um, things started to change a little bit. So uh, the, the more these uh, these uh, 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 lockdown period and this pandemic uh, grew long in the tooth, the more people started becoming nostalgic about an excellent workspace. And I'm saying excellent because that, that is really um, important because, um, you know, people feel like going back to a workplace that is commute worthy, right? And so uh, this is creating, and it has accentuated a little bit the trends that we've seen before the pandemic in the sense that we had we had a lot of, uh, um, you know, class A and trophy building we're still uh, not having too many problems in terms of vacancy, while uh, you know a class B, class C buildings, uh, we're having more of a problem. And we think that with the return to the office, this is going to become even more apparent. Um, you know, like uh, as we uh, as we uh, recover from from this pandemic, and uh, um, and, and so uh, we've seen um, in terms of uh, um, uh, rental rates, the asking rates. Um, you know, have not really budged very much. In fact, they've increased across Canada for pretty much all markets. Uh, although uh, the uh, the effective rates might be different because uh, the effective rates take into account also uh, concessions that uh, uh, that landlords uh, accord to uh, to tenants, and we've seen that pretty much across the board. So in in, in office space, but also in retail space, you know, on the leasing side. So that's really um, interesting. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so sorry, I, I, so, I, 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 I no, no, I'm absolutely. Sure no, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I, I think it's, we're getting some great questions in from the audience. So I think you've been keying on uh, a lot of things that they're interested in as well. I mean, again, we look at the consumer space in terms of uh, real estate uh, prices, and they're just through the roof. I mean, you, you would think that with you know people not going into the office as much uh, moving forward as we were pre-pandemic, that maybe prices would have been holding. So it's really interesting to hear that uh, you're seeing kind of prices jump as much as, uh, as they have. So uh, one of the questions that someone has submitted is, do you think the price of commercial real estate is going to go up, down, hold steady? I mean, uh, obviously it's a speculative question, but um, what is your data uh, starting to show? Well, so far we are actually in the process of uh, going through our first quarter statistics uh, now as we speak. So we are going to come out with our uh, first quarter reports soon. Uh, but I, I do have information on fourth quarter data, if you want. So, uh, as I mentioned, um, you know, uh, rental rates have been held steady, and in many cases, we've seen increases. Uh, and this was during the worst period that, you know, uh, Canada and the world, I would say, has experienced in terms of, you know, uh, social restrictions. So, um, and, I, and I'm cognizant of the fact that uh, government, federal uh, financial support has been helpful in, in that extent. But, uh, you know, I think that the worst is sort of like beyond us. Uh, and uh, so if uh, um, rental rates have increased or have remained steady, I think that, uh, um, you know, the, uh, the future is pretty bright on that, on that side. Perfect. No, that's, uh, that's great to hear as well. So, um, so you mentioned that there was kind of like a, a cadence to your know, uh, occupancy rates across major cities. Has that held throughout, um, you know, the pandemic as well? Has there been any kind of moving in rankings and occupancy rates? We have a specific, uh, specific question on the vacancy rates in Calgary and, and um, what, what that outlook looks like as well. Yeah. So Calgary, um, unfortunately, um, has been affected by um, the oil and gas industries and its fortunes, right, especially in Canada. So there's been a lot of consolidation in that sector with a lot of uh, um, companies headquartered in Calgary uh, leaving Canada or going bankrupt. And uh, uh, unfortunately, that space has not been uh, filled by other businesses or another industry entering. So that was something that preceded the pandemic. And of course, the pandemic has not helped. So um, if I recall uh, the uh, from the top of my head, the, the Calgary vacancy rate, so there's a big difference between urban and suburban um, uh, submarkets. So the, the uh, urban um, uh, submarket has uh, vacancy rate around 30%. 
27, 30%, and uh, uh, suburban is a little bit better, but still, you know, in the high 20s. And I, and I hate to put you on the spot. We have a fast follow-up question to that as well with, with Edmonton. Is Edmonton get similar levels as well? I apologize to this year. Edmonton is a little lower, but and I could get back to you. I don't have the numbers, unfortunately, in front of me, but it's uh, similarly uh, difficult, the situation there. Uh, than Calgary, because it's also another oil market. Perfect. So I imagine anybody who has questions specific about occupancy rates in each city can go to uh, JLL and you have a, a kind of a, a source on, on city province uh, based reports. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so curious question for me. So we've seen change in, in small business behavior. I mean, during the pandemic, there's a lot of online transactions, a lot of the um, you know, way that we consume goods has, has really changed. I and mean, it really puts things like, I would, I would assume shopping malls at a, uh, at a very difficult position. Um, do we, I guess, does data kind of show that that's just going to be a blip in the radar? Is there speculation that it's going to get back to what it was before? Or how is, how is the market responding to, uh, to shopping malls and, and the ability to kind of Congress in, in, in one place? Yeah, so that's, that's really uh, an interesting uh, question because as I said, um, the pandemic has not only affected uh, office markets, but it has affected the entire um, uh, uh, commercial real estate uh, industry. And uh, uh, the way uh, retail has adapted, and I would like to, uh, to call it adapted because uh, I, I think uh, it is the right word for this uh, in, in this circumstance, but it, it's an adaptation that I think will, will have a long life, right? So the, um, a lot of uh, stores have uh, uh, developed their omni-channel strategies and have adapted to their uh, customers' delivery preferences through, um, you know, uh, new um, new ways of delivering their products. Like, for instance, uh, you probably are familiar with curbside or uh, in-person pickup services. Also, some malls have uh, now uh, set up uh, a web service where people can go there and select you know, have access basically to the inventory of uh, uh, of uh, uh, the different stores and select the products that they they like to to, to purchase, and they don't need to uh, to go in the mall and do proper shopping and, and procure themselves for these uh, for these products. So these are all very innovative um, products, if we want to call it that way, that that are the result of uh, of uh, the, the pandemic and the health restrictions. And uh, so uh, in terms of how they fared, uh, obviously, you know, the larger, uh, larger malls, especially the, way, uh, the ones that are uh, anchored by uh, grocery uh, or uh, big box uh, retail stores, they've done really well. Others, uh, you know, uh, have done less so. And, and there is also a, a big discrepancy before uh, be, between, um, you know, uh, suburban malls and, uh, and, downtown uh, retail cores, uh, retail streets, right? So it, it's been because of the uh, of uh, the decline in food traffic downtown, um, you know, retailers have, uh, have, have suffered a little bit more than retailers in, in suburban areas. Um, and, uh, um, and obviously this trend will change as we emerge from the pandemic and people go back to uh, to, uh, uh, to normal, uh, but yeah. uh, uh, for the moment, that's what, what we've seen anyway. Sounds good. I always hesitate to say normal as well because I, I feel like nothing's ever gonna be the same again. Claudia, thank you very much for providing your insight across here. There's a few other questions that people have asked, but we'll, uh, we'll take a look at them uh, potentially afterwards or as we wrap up. I wanna make sure that we have time for uh, Pierre and uh, his, his insights from a colleague's point of view. So Claudia, thank you very much for sharing that. Um, Sandra, as we transition into talking about the economy, um, can we bring up the next polling question? All right. Um, so at any point during the pandemic, did you dream about starting your own business? So the first one is not at all. I would love to, but it's unrealistic. I thought about it uh, somewhat seriously. I am planning to launch my own business. This is, and I understand, hey, we're all in the credit industry, we all have employers, we're not gonna share this information back with you, but I, I think, you know, it's, it's all taken us, uh, given us a moment to really pause and think about, uh, you know, what we do and what's a priority. And, you know, we look at the responses here, 75.9% not at all. So 
all your current employers, I'm sure, would be very happy that uh, you're, you're staying with them. You're going to be in the office, and that uh, you weren't dreaming of, of, of larger things. And um, you know, there are a few of us. It looks like uh, considering a side hustle. I mean, there's a lot of things happening uh, in terms of organizations like uh, you know, Shopify, making it easy enough to set up your own business. A lot of the subsidies that started up. If, if you were really thinking about making a change in your career, there's a lot of things that happened during the pandemic to really uh, feed into uh, your, your wants, needs, desires. So uh, again, everybody, thank you for uh, providing a quick response there. And with that, we will uh, move over to Pierre. So Pierre, um, so most of the pandemic period was marked by kind of this continually changing mandates and restrictions on small businesses. So clearly this is something that uh, from an economist perspective has required a close eye every day. Can you share with us maybe how you and your team have stayed informed and engaged throughout the pandemic? I mean, so much change. What, what did you do to actually understand what was going on? Actually, uh, it's a very good question. At the beginning of the pandemic in April, uh, March, April 2020, we started to uh, to do a survey every second week to make sure that we fully understood the impact of the pandemic on small business across the country. And uh, we slowed down, you know, after uh, three or four months. But at the beginning, it really was really helpful to get uh, the, the pulse of uh, what's going on. Yeah, I'm very difficult to understand because there was always different grants, different subsidies, um, the supply chain issues. I mean, again, from an economist, you're you're fighting a hundred different angles at any given time. So, um, yeah, I don't envy this, the seat you were sitting in trying to figure it out as we went. So, um, obviously, I share some insights off, off the top. You're an economist. So I'm not going to steal your thunder by any means. But, um, you know, before we talk about inflation, gas, uh, gas prices and uh and interest rates, are there anything that uh, that BDC is um, really seeing that's been driving trends outside of that? Well, you know, the, the two two things. The first one is uh, we really went from a, a demand issue to a supply issue. At the beginning of the pandemic, because of the government restrictions, a lot of small business were facing a slower demand. So uh, that was really uh, difficult. They, they, they saw their revenue drop uh, very, very quickly. And now that uh, the pandemic, uh, most of the restrictions has been uh, left, well, the demand is strong. The demand for uh, most sectors is very strong. This few exceptions, uh, everything related to tourism, uh, for example, accommodation and food services, the demand is still lower. And uh, art, uh, for example, the demand is still lower. And the uh, downtown area, uh, Claudia was saying, you know, that the real estate uh, or the uh, real estate, the commercial real estate in the downtown area was a bit more difficult. And that's basically, that's true also for small business. And if, uh, downtown Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver, uh, there's not as many people going to work downtown now. So uh, the retail and personal services businesses has been suffering and they're still, you know, struggling to get out of the of the of the recession. But for the rest of the economy, the recovery is, is there. Uh, the demand is strong. The issue now is on the supply side. And these two uh, issues, one is the supply chain, the other one is a shortage of labor. But supply chain is surprisingly a bigger issue right now. There's a lot of difficulties to get the products that people need. And also the, the cost of shipping and the cost of products has been really increasing. So that's basically the challenge for a lot of business. The uh, business is good, demand is there, but there's a supply issue. Yeah, it was interesting. We had a uh, webinar late last year talking about the food ser the service industry. And um, it was surprising that, you know, you would think this, the, the struggles at the beginning of the pandemic would have been kind of the worst of it. But, you know, as we learned, there's just more complications that keep on adding in and, and changing the dynamics of the space. So um, I want to dive into it because I can already see we have a, a team of questions coming in. And, and this is a reminder for the audience as well, where we have access to Pierre's time. If there's any questions you'd like to ask him directly, uh, we'll try our best to uh, to ask him and, and and not stump him, but we'll bring up some interesting questions. So I want to transition right here into inflation rates. So I, I sorry, every conversation I've been having lately is about inflation and what's going on. And obviously, rates are climbing. So can you can you share with us what your perspective of is of what's going on and really what we can all expect in 2022? Well, there's two reasons why we inflation is so high. There's a strong demand for products. You know, retail sales increase in Canada by 5% in 2021. 
uh, the job market has been good. There was government programs, so the demand is strong, and that's one reason why the uh, prices are increasing. The second reason is on the supply chain. Uh, there was a lot of disruption in the supply chain, a strong increase in shipping costs. So that's the second reason why we had inflation. So at the beginning of the year, we thought that inflation would slow down this year. We were expecting you know, to conclude 2022 with an inflation more around 3%. Interest rates uh, are expected to increase as well. But the war came in. And that's going to have an impact on inflation. It's already having an impact on energy prices. So unfortunately, uh, with the current situation, we believe inflation is going to stay elevated in Canada, probably around 4 and 5% uh, current this year. Okay, wow. Um, so fairly significant. And again, uh, us as you know, professionals in the credit industry, having to factor that into uh, pricing our goods, services, our, our credit limits. I mean, it's uh, it's an ongoing role. So I like to think that everybody on the on the, the audience here is becoming their own mini economist based on what's going on and the impacts to their industry. Um, so again, you mentioned the the, the conflict in, in in Eastern Europe. So I know it's it's a sensitive topic. I mean, it's it's all over the news right now, and it, it seems like we're just early days into what's going on there. Um, I guess. Can, can you share with us, if you if you allowed or, or can, about what we believe the impact is going to be back on our oil and gas sector? Claudia just mentioned kind of the, the impact within Alberta with commercial real estate. And, um, you know, are we, is there speculation we're going to drive up production and, and really what's really what's going to happen um, from your point of view? Well, the conflict is raising the price of oil. The, the oil price has been increasing very significantly. And this is uh, good and bad. This is good for a, a country like Canada, which produce oil. So it means that uh, every time you sell a barrel of oil, you get more money for it. On top of it, we will probably increase our export in terms of volume, not only in terms of value, but in terms of volume. So this is all good for the Canadian economy, especially for provinces producing oil like uh, Saskatchewan, Alberta, Newfoundland, and even Manitoba. So that's the positive side. The negative side is the cost for cons Canadian consumers is increasing. And that means that uh, the money that you're going to spend on gasoline, well, you're not going to spend it somewhere else. So this is something we are following very closely to see what would be the impact on Canadian consumption this year. The fact that the, uh, the inflation is increasing and especially the energy price is increasing. We still believe that this is not going to have a huge impact. And we believe that the Canadian economy will continue to have a positive growth, despite the fact that the uh, energy price is increasing. But it's something that we follow very closely. That's, that's great to hear. And I think, uh, I mean, well, to a certain extent, that it is uh, supportive uh, for our economy. And especially when you look at markets like Alberta, that they've, they've had some troubling years. I and mean, we're not back in the, the heydays of what uh, oil and gas was in that, that province. And, it gives us at least a sense of optimism. I know a lot of the credit managers I've talked to who own uh, national accounts, national portfolios, always struggle to understand exactly what's going on there and the, and the cascading impact. So um, as much as it's it's tough to say that, you know, uh, the conflict is has positive impact, impacts to the economy, it's, it's kind of nice to hear because it's going to give us a, a potential boost and resurgence in, in, small, in the small business space. So let's transition across to, to interest rates. So interest rates have been uh, an interesting dynamic here over the past year as you know, we, we talk about real estate. I mean, um, not just on the commercial side, but on the consumer side. So we have a hot real estate market. We have interest rates that could be used to temper it down, but also not to the capacity where we want to put people in a, in a bad state. So can you give us your perspective on, on the interest rates and, and kind of what we should expect here in 2022? As you know, interest rates are very low. They increased for the first time uh, last week, but the prime rate in Canada is still 0.5%. Uh, so we should expect uh, an increase in interest rate for two reasons. Uh, the, the first one is uh, they are too low. I mean, the, the Bank of Canada reduced interest rate to stimulate the economy. Now that the economy is back on track, except for some sectors, uh, there's no need to keep interest rate at this level. And if you keep low interest rate for too long, you create distortion. For example, you mentioned the housing market that is a mis uh, 
probably probably too hot. So that's the first reason to increase interest rate to a more a neutral level where interest rate is not going to stimulate the economy because the economy basically is back on track. The second reason is we talked about it is inflation. There's a lot of inflation pressure. Increasing interest rate could uh, uh, reduce inflation. So that's the second reason to increase interest rate. So I think there's a consensus that interest rates are going to increase this year, but they are going to increase slowly. That's my vision is we're going to see two or three more increases. Probably we're going to conclude 2022 with a prime rate around 1%, and interest rate will continue to increase in 2023 until we reach kind of a neutral rate, which in Canada, it means a prime rate around 1.75. One would be around 1.75, 2%. I think interest rate will be uh, will stay there for a while. So increase, but a slow increase. To, to, the Bank of Canada want to make sure that they are not going to slow down the growth. So they will increase interest rate, but at, uh, you know, at a very slow pace. Well, no, thank you for that perspective. And, uh, you know, we're, we're very blessed to have access to your time, your, the perspectives, the team that uh, you have access to, to, to ask these questions as well. So, um, I mean, part of the, the question around oil and gas, we can transition back to that is, um, do any speculation on how long these oil prices might might stick around for? Obviously, they have cascading impacts on the transportation industry and um, even to, to tourism. I mean, uh, locally, people driving across Canada, hopping their RVs, going across uh, North America. How long do we, can this actually hold up for, given uh, what you're hearing and what you're seeing? Well, it all depends on the conflict in, uh, in Russia, because as you know, Russia, it's a major producer of oil around the world. And it doesn't impact Canada, but it does impact the world price. So if the conflict is very long, uh, and um, for example, if uh, Europe decides to stop buying oil from, from Russia, uh, the, pr the price would continue to increase. Uh, if we have a, a resolution of the conflict, well, price is going to go, to go down pretty much quickly. So it's very difficult to evaluate. Right now, we believe that the price will stay elevated for a while. Um, and you know, the, although the price is very elevated, you, we have to remember that in, to, in 2008, uh, the price was as high as today. And this is not unique. This is not exceptional. This is, we, we have seen a high price like this in the past. This one it is a very specific reason for that, it's a conflict between Russia and Ukraine, and the evolution of the price will really depend of the, on this conflict. Okay, so again, the, the longer that draws out, you know, the the, the higher the, the the price per barrel could be sticking around, or, and actually have an impact on our economy. I guess both for the positive and the negative. So, no, this uh, that's great to hear. Great to know. We've received so many questions, and I apologize to the audience. Um, I'd like to be able to pose them all. Um, but again, we, we are short on time as well. Um, so I'm going to go through and, um, I guess just talk about the, I guess the, the transition across from the, the global, um, commercial real estate uh, market as well. So uh, we heard some interesting things from Claudia about, um, the, the changes kind of province to province. Um, was there anything that you found very interesting, kind of what was brought up and, uh, in, in terms of, um, I guess, growth. Again, everybody's really interested on the um, the online spending. Um, from BDC, you work with a lot, like, again, tens of thousands of entrepreneurs. In terms of the incoming applications and businesses you're working from, have you seen a change or a mix in the, in the applications that have come across? Definitely, we see more online business and we saw a shift during the pandemic from a lot of businesses to uh, they are investing to increase their ability to sell online. And we also, because of that, we see a stronger demand for uh, industrial space like uh, warehousing. And to, you know, in, uh, from our data, what we see is there's a very low uh, inoccupancy rate in terms of uh, warehouses and also industrial space. So uh, our understanding is we have underbuilt, our, uh, we have underinvested in uh, those two categories. And that's the reason why the pri prices are increasing. And actually our uh, number of loans in that, those two categories are really increasing. 
So this is uh, what we see on the office space because of the pandemic. Uh, there's still a lot of capacity on the uh, warehouse and industrial capacity is almost full. Perfect. Great. Thank you, Pierre, so much for sharing uh, that insight. And on behalf, of, I think, of all of us as you know, people who support small businesses, um, the efforts that BDC has gone through during the, the course of the pandemic have been truly inspirational. We've heard a lot of great stories of the support that BDC has provided throughout the course of the pandemic. So thank you very much on behalf of myself and the audience on that. Um, so with that, let's um, transition across to um, kind of wrapping things up. We're near the top of the hour here. So um, I guess, Sandra, in terms of um, what we want to be able to go through, if you just transition to the next slide here. So uh, really, on behalf of Equifax Canada, I'd like to uh, extend a great appreciation to our panelists today. Um, I, I genuinely enjoy the dialogue and have a number of items that I personally will be taking forward. Um, there's definitely a lot more to be said about the commercial real estate industry, as well as the economy as it continues to evolve. So, so stay tuned. Uh, if you'd like to hear more about what we've talked about, I encourage you to connect with the panelists and their respective organizations. And like Sandra mentioned off the top, before you log out, please take an opportunity to fill out the survey and feel free to share any thoughts about today's webinar, as well as any recommendation for future events. And you know, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, for those who dialed in late um, or would like to share the session with a friend or colleague, I'll, uh, we will be sending a link to the recording uh, within 24 hours here. So also a, a quick reminder that uh, we have another webinar slated for next week, March 22nd, with our head of fraud and identity, uh, Carl Davies. So to receive a link to register, um, there's the option within the, the windows here today, as well as um, you can go ahead and follow Equifax Canada on LinkedIn to receive the updates and some of the details. All right, so a special thanks to our webinar production team, Stephen, Sandra, Robin, Robert, and Shornima for helping put this together. And thank you everybody for attending today.